Hi, and welcome to Ed Talks. I'm Sheila McManus, one of the Board of Governors teaching chairs here at the University of Lethbridge, and I'm here today with anthropology professor Jan Newberry. So thank you very much for coming to talk to me today, Jan. Oh, you're welcome, Sheila. I'm glad to do it. I want to start by asking you about your big award. Yeah. So last year, the American Anthropological Association, uh, in conjunction with Oxford University Press, awarded you their Excellence in Teaching Award. Is that mm -hmm. the right? Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. Excellence under uh, all right. So tell me more about the award. Well, it was uh, very exciting. I was very chuffed about the whole thing, I have to say. Um, this actually uh, happened because a colleague of mine nominated me, um, and I said, are you crazy? That will, <laughs> that will never happen. Um, and I didn't know it was happening, actually. The reason I found out is they had to ask me for some information for the file. What's wonderful about the, the award is that it was based on comments from students here at the University of Lethbridge mm -hmm. and from Bryn Mawr College, where I taught before I came here. Mm -hmm. So all the students across my teaching career uh, wrote nice things about me, apparently. Uh, I've never actually seen the full file. <laughs> um, and the, but the award is for recognition for uh, teaching in the classroom, uh, undergraduates primarily. Yeah. Outstanding. Oh, and I got a crystal apple in Washington, D.C. Big excitement. Very nice. Yes. I couldn't tell from the picture. I could tell you were holding something, but I couldn't tell what you were holding. No, it's so a, a crystal apple. Yes, it oh, cool. provided excitement on the way back on the plane. As I went through the security, they looked at my bag. They said, do you have an apple? <laughs> I said, well, no. Knowing I was traveling internationally, I said, of course I have no fruit. <laughs> Do you mean the fruit? And then, of course, it was this crystal apple had showed right. up on the X-ray machine. So be about. careful of what awards you yes, win. That's exactly. You know, you that might shape not. could really set something <laughs> off. You might not be able to bring them home. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Still, excellent recognition for you. Yeah. Well deserved. I've read a little bit of the comments that were published about it. Um, and certainly, yeah, there's a lot mm. of love from your students um, in there. What value do you think teaching awards have? in terms of raising the profile of teaching or uh, mm -hmm. um, adding some value to that? You know, I found the award both uh, gratifying but embarrassing at some level. Um, and it certainly is not why I teach, why I care about my teaching. It was nice to be recognized. Um, inside the university, uh, as you know, uh, we are, uh, our performance is evaluated based on our teaching and our research and our service, teaching and research being approximately the same. Uh, but those of us who care a lot about teaching often find that we don't get as much recognition. So the teaching award, I think, helps in that way. Um, you know, people in the institution pay more attention to the value of teaching if you get outside recognition, I suppose, as well as inside recognition. So there's that. I have to say, for me, the best part of it was knowing that students had taken the time and energy to uh, say things about me when asked to do that. Um, it was very nice, right? Yeah. Uh, they're busy, they have their lives, they have other things they need to do, so that they would do that, I think, is, is marvelous. Yeah. Um, and it certainly it gave me more energy and more excitement about my teaching. And it reminded me, in fact, uh, th I th because I think it's quite easy to forget uh, that teaching, um, I mean, I love teaching. It's the thing that my energy always goes to, quickly, easily, whereas my research, I have to remind myself, go do your research now. <laughs> um, so that's not a, a, a problem, but the, the, the award reminded me that it, it still doesn't have the same value in the institution uh, as research, for the most part, I think. Mm. It seems to be sort of a pattern with teaching awards. I mean, even here, the, the Board of Governors teaching chair versus research chair, mm. they're not really comparable positions at all. Teaching awards are lovely and come with crystal apples. <laughs> um, there, there's often perhaps more attention and more money and more That's right. status given to research awards. Um, do you think it can help at a university um, to raise the tide a little bit when we can get to feature some of our great teachers getting these teaching awards, whether it's the Internal Distinguished Teaching Award or these really important external ones. As you say, it brings some attention to teaching at a university level. You were all over mm -hmm. you know, the university <laughs> yes. webpage for a while. Sadly. Um, what do you think, what kind of role can they serve in terms of maybe raising the tide a little bit? That's a good, that's a good question. And I'll, I'll answer it 
slightly from a, a different angle. Um, the Teaching Fellow, we have a teaching center on campus, and the Teaching Fellow is a wonderful opportunity to become involved. And it's amazing how many people still don't know about them. And once you become a Teaching Fellow, people will say, well, gee, what is this thing? What is this thing they call the Teaching Fellow? And, and then they become interested. In fact, I think some of our current Teaching Fellows came along that path, knowing somebody personally who mm -hmm. was a Teaching Fellow and getting inspired. So I think the awards can do that. They raise the profile of, of seeing someone you know who has gotten this award. Then it becomes a doable thing in your own mind. Oh, there's some, there's a goal for me. Mm -hmm. There's something I can aim for as well, mm -hmm. right? I think it, I, I, this is a bit of a repetition of what we just said. We know research is key. You, you must know that your, your evaluation at the university is based so strongly on research. And it's easy enough to let your teaching become the back burner for you. It's, it's something we all do, and we're doing it all the time. But research is where I'm going to get the accolades, we think. So I think you're right. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for raising, uh, pointing out that the rewards can be multiple for teaching, mm -hmm. just as they are for research. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we should pay attention to it at the same level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with yeah. you. And Absolutely. at least, you know, it draws attention to, mm -hmm. I think, as well, the great teachers on campus. Um, so Thank some you. of the comments that your students made about you um, were about your uh, out-of-the-box teaching style, mm -hmm. um, as well as I really liked one of the comments that was published about sort of modeling a better way to be a human being, oh, which mm -hmm. I thought was really lovely. Um, what do you think your strengths are as a teacher, and how did you get there? I will, I'll start by saying I'm an anthropologist, uh, and that's important here for me, uh, because anthropology is the study of humans. To, so, so to some degree, what I do as a cultural anthropologist is study what it means to be a good human in different cultures. So that idea of what is the character of the human and how we understand it is part of my research life as well. Um, and so I bring it into the classroom. I think, uh, in terms of what distinguishes me as a teacher, um, it is that I care very much not just that I deliver content, that they learn some things, but that they use them. They use the things that I ask them to and, mm -hmm. and try themselves to think like an anthropologist. Most of them will not become anthropologists, but for the space of the class, I want them to try and think through the issues of my discipline mm -hmm. and how it makes you think about being a human and the different ways one can be a human. So a lot of my teaching is aimed at that. I think that that might be what they're talking about, mm -hmm. being a better human, right? How, what, does, what is the character of, of humanity mm -hmm. and to be a human? Um, the out-of-the-box teaching, I think, I'm not entirely sure what they're after there. <laughs> But I will say that I think one of the things that students respond to strongly from me is that I respect them. Uh, I respect mm -hmm. them as humans mm -hmm. and that they bring something to the classroom too. It's not just that I give, they receive, they give as well. And so in the classroom, as much as I can set up that give and take, mm -hmm. that their ideas actually inform the classroom as much as my ideas then they see that I respect you. I respect what you have to say. Even if you disagree with me, in fact, I like it best if mm -hmm. you disagree with me. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about what's going on there. So, and I treat them with the generosity. I think this is one of the things that I care about very much. I treat them generously. I interpret, try to interpret their goals and their actions generously, mm. which I think is very hard for us, especially after we've taught a while. You begin to be a little bit suspicious. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so maintaining your respect and generosity for the students, I think, is really key and hard to do. Hard yeah. to do. I mean, not that I do it all the time. I lose it. Especially at the end of the semester, <laughs> Sheila. I think that's a really interesting point, just respecting them as people, because um, there's so many of our colleagues who, for me, a pet peeve is hearing our colleagues refer to our students as kids. Mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. no, they're not kids. Like, they're, they're an adult who's chosen to show up in my class that day. Or, um, and I think that that, I think they understand that respect. They pick up on that respect, you know, and it really affects um, the teaching as well. Mm -hmm. I know a couple other strengths that you're really known for on campus is active learning mm -hmm. and also group work, really productive, useful group work. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, 
examples of those two in your classes and sure. why those are a couple of your strengths? And I'll just to follow up on what you said a minute ago, so I often teach, my intros are usually 180 people. And so one of the reasons that treating them like individual humans is as mu in as much as I can is important mm -hmm. is they don't feel that in a, in a big classroom. They feel a number, they're just another body a, in the room. And so as much as you can make them feel like, no, you know, you're a person in this room that contributes, it breaks down that sense of this is such a big class and I don't have to care very much or mm -hmm. be very invested. So I use active learning actually to, to do that. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I've written about this actually. Um, in my intro class, the first day, it's so important to get them to talk, and not just to me, but to yeah. each other. And it humanizes the classroom, and you don't feel so much like, oh, what am I doing here in this big, scary classroom? And so I make sure that we do something together. I, uh, I, I structure an activity that makes them speak to one another, gains, ask for information, share it back to the whole class. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I think very strongly is it, if on the first day if they hear their own voice in that classroom and they hear the voices of others, that will continue. And, it, and it's, at least that's been my experience. Yeah. So, yeah. And, I th and, and just on that point, active learning we often think has to be in a small classroom. Mm -hmm. That is not true at all. You mm -hmm. can do active learning. And I'm always seeking to find new ways, by the way, to do active learning in the big fixed seat lecture hall, yeah. which really works against us, right? Yeah. Yeah. So but that it is possible. It is possible. It is possible. It is possible. You know, you tell people you do these kinds of things in a big class and they're a bit stunned. It's like, it's totally possible. Our, right. our first year classes are only up to nine. I'm like, it's totally doable. I run discussion groups all the time. Not mm -hmm. a problem. No. You know, 180. True. Brave woman. <laughs> well, and, well, and the discussion groups are very hard there. In fact, I'm always thinking about that. I, and I have a new idea about using zones, classroom zones. So this zone will be a, cla a discussion based. Yeah. Uh, this will be the discussion group, this zone. Um, so that you know if you're sitting in this general area, mm. you're going you're gonna to have something to do with those people. As you know, students always end up sitting in the same place. Yeah. So if you end up hating your yeah. zone, you can always move to another <laughs> zone. So that's one of the things that I care very much about in terms of active learning is getting them talking mm -hmm. and then seeing that their contributions actually change the conversation in the class. I think, I think some of our colleagues and certainly many of our students think that there is a set piece of information. You can put it in this box and this class, this box will be delivered to me, and yeah. then I'll just open it as if it were Christmas Day. <laughs> and instead, what happens is we create something together. I certainly bring more at the beginning because mm -hmm. I'm trained to, that's my expertise. Uh, but what they care to hear and what they're able to hear determines what I give to them. And I don't think students actually realize that, that how much we gauge watching them, oh, they don't understand this at all, mm -hmm. fall back, explain this from a different uh, perspective uh, so that I can get them to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. And that's key to me to, to being able to deliver any content is whether they're actually receiving it or mm -hmm. not, right? So that one of the things I think is really useful is for students to get the sense that, oh, I said this and now she's actually changing somewhat what, she, what she's talking about to, to see what, you know, to explore what I care about mm -hmm. here. Um, and so that's an important part of this active learning um, approach that I really value. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to follow up on that in terms of group work, group work is often where you can get that started if it's not working in the classroom in general. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had a class, let me just be clear, since I got nice teaching accolades, I struggle in the classroom <laughs> always, still. We'll come um, back to that later. <laughs> problems in the classroom. Um, it was a quiet class uh, and I would ask, I would open a question and did not get much response. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that I had worked very hard, I felt to start to build that momentum towards group work. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, I will give them a problem uh, based on something I've told them and then they work it through together in a group. And this is where very shy students are able to find their voice or at least see other people talking and then they say, oh, you, that's possible, I could talk too. <laughs> and then they share it out in the big classroom mm -hmm. and people see that sort of building momentum. That's a very important part of that active learning, I think. Um, and what happens if you do that effectively and enough, then that scary space of the classroom changes and they, and they talk more. Now in this particular class that I taught, it didn't work quite the way that I expected. <laughs> 
Uh, and I, one of the things I learned from that is I needed to do it more and longer. Usually I do it for a while, yeah. and then we can do it as a group. And, I, I, and, the, and the group work becomes more, I use it for specific issues. Mm -hmm. But in this classroom, I needed to persist with that uh, because at the end of the class, they were terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in sort of the middle, they still wanted me to do too much of the work. And, and that's a problem, I feel like, when, when they are asking me to do all the work, things are not going well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It shows what they expect of education, mm -hmm. too, right? That, I mean, some of us who try for more active learning styles, there can sometimes be a bit of pushback on oh, evaluations absolutely. or whatever mm -hmm. because they want you to just hand them the box, mm -hmm. right, and grade them on how well they open the box, mm -hmm. you know. Um, what would you say, I think a lot of our colleagues, a lot of us have struggled with incorporating group work because mm -hmm. maybe a lot of us were the smart kid who hated group work. Right. So I've been working on it myself in the last couple of years, primarily not in an evaluative or actual assignment sense, but to get discussions going exactly. in the classroom. What are some of the strategies for making that work well for you, even if most oh, of us who wind up as profs right, right. were the ones who hated the group work, but even to make it work as a classroom strategy, so you've identified getting them talking mm -hmm. to each other and, mm -hmm. and then as a bigger group to make it a more reciprocal right. re relationship. What else can you use that kind of strategy for? Two things, and I'll try to remember them both. The first one is that many of our colleagues are worried about loss of content delivery, that mm -hmm. when they're in groups, content is not being delivered, and therefore I'm losing class time for that's important to me. And, and you know, to be fair, this is often folks who are teaching things like mathematics, and I need yeah. to cover this yeah. by the end of the semester. And if I do group work, then I've lost that time for instruction, right? So one of the things I say is that group work is always about content, but often it's about Absolutely. building the skills to effectively take in the yeah. content and use it, right? So I never see it as a trade-off in content. Um, for me, one of the things that's happened in uh, thinking about group work is, I often assume they know something, and I am completely amazed at the things that they do not know, mm -hmm. and that I must stop and teach. So to, to my colleagues who are quite content-driven, I would say, don't assume that they actually understand fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And you will do so much better if you stop and make sure that the fundamentals are covered. And I'll give you an example, writing a research paper. So I assign research papers and there's some uh, fundamentals I believe that they come with and then I'll be completely amazed to find out they don't know some very very basic thing mm -hmm. like where do I go to find out how this citation style works um, and I think hasn't someone told you <laughs> uh, and I someone think, else someone else <laughs> and then I realize well it's me it's to me because I've identified that so group work of, often for me can actually help identify those deficits in mm -hmm. interesting ways. So if you give them something to do together, they find either because they are getting braver or because they're trying to work the problem out, they'll say, but but I don't know what I need to know to do this. Mm -hmm. And then they come back to you. And, and that's actually wonderful. I, uh, and let me just stop and make a real um, uh, um, plea to take this seriously as educators. This is when I learn the shortcomings of my own teaching. Mm -hmm. When they come back to me and say, well, we don't understand this thing. And I think, oi. <laughs> so now we must do that, right? Yeah. Um, and, but it's terrific for me because I think I've said it. I think I've communicated it. And I have not. Right? Yeah, so I'm pretty sure you've never said that at all. And you think I said this five times. At least five times. Oh, OK. That's right. Yeah. And I do think that, that you just need to take that seriously. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that you can use it very effectively for things you need to do anyway. So one of the things I do is uh, study guides. Now, it's very easy oh, okay. to give a study guide. Say, so here's the list of things I want you to study. Yeah. And then the students go off and study them. I try to make them build their own study guide. It, it, in the intro courses, I don't do this uh, because of scale issues. Mm. Um, I'll say, okay, in groups, I want you to tell me what are the key words you think I'm going to cover on this um, mm. exam. And it, there are a couple of great effects of that. First of all, they look at each other <laughs> <laughs> with panic. How are we to know what's going to be covered on this exam? Well, of course you know. It's what I talked to you about. So it makes them look, they pull out their notes mm -hmm. and they start going like this, which is the wonderful thing about this is the ones who don't take good notes are looking at the others <laughs> and saying, what are these notes that you've taken? <laughs> and then they start building it. And in the class I just taught this last semester, I liked this quite a bit, I asked them to, by group, put up their study guide. And so then they start looking and they say, oh, look, look at the words that they came up with that we didn't come up with. 
right? And they start comparing around the room, yeah. which is quite nice. And again, an active use of the classroom. So they sit in a group and then someone has to get up, walk over and bravely write down uh, their terms. After they've done that and they're looking, as I say, and comparing it, then I pull up and I say, okay, you're exactly right. Here are the things that we'll be covering. Hmm. And we've just done the study guide together, right? So that's not sacrificing content. That's yeah. something you needed to yeah. do anyway. And what did you do, just do? What did you just do? You just reviewed yeah. at the same time. Yeah, and you've gotten them involved in the process. Exactly. You know, getting... And realize that the review process, I'm always telling students this, they don't entirely believe me. I shouldn't have to review with you. You should know at some level what I think is important based on what we've talked about in this mm -hmm. class. So it's an encouragement to be po active in your own. She talks about this, and this theme has shown up. Mm -hmm. I can see it myself. So the review is just a reminder. You actually already know that. Yeah, yeah, and just encouraging them about that too. You already know this. Don't worry, you already know That's this. That's right. It's, it's very know. reassuring. You already know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know that one of the aspects that really interests you about interdisciplinary learning, LibEd, uh, your earlier experiences at Bryn Mawr, um, the mapping course that you developed here on campus, is the piece of community engagement, getting your students to look beyond the walls of the university. And that also came up in the citation for your teaching award. Where does that interest come from for you, and how does it play out in your teaching? I think one of the, it touches on my, the theme I talked about earlier that, let me start and say this a little differently. I am an academic, a pointy-headed academic. <laughs> I love <laughs> ideas, right? I'm, I do what I do primarily because I care about ideas and I think they're powerful, right? So I spent my life in an institution <laughs> devoted to ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't ever think that they make any sense unless they are put to use at some level, right? Yeah. yeah. It's one thing to, to think about uh, some important concept, but only when I try to apply it in the world. And for me as a cultural anthropologist, that's understanding other people and how they are in the world. Mm -hmm. Then those ideas actually take on meaning and human meaning in a way I care about. So I think that's part of it. Uh, the Bryn Mawr um, Praxis course was to balance those things. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that that's an important thing. It's not that we're just launching students into the community to go do service <laughs> learning, but that they are using that very important experience to reflect on what they're learning. Mm -hmm. And that in the classroom, they're saying, okay, you're presenting me with these ideas, with these ways of thinking, and now I have something to apply it to. Um, I think as an anthropologist, perhaps, we, we love theory, so we often are talking about theoretical concepts, but not until you try to apply it to something yeah. in the world does it actually make sense to you. Um, and so the community service learning was a, a big part of that. Now, coming to the University of Lethbridge, um, I was interested actually in trying something like that when I first came and got distracted and moved off to do other, other things. But the mapping course was to have a community service uh, hmm. learning component yeah. originally. Yeah. Uh, but they're a little hard to set up, especially in a course-based format because this was a, uh, in the first iteration there were 20 students, so you have to have 20 placements. Mm -hmm. And we do have a marvelous uh, co-op and applied studies office here yeah. on, on campus, but that's a lot of work for them to manage. Yeah. And as a professor, and this is, goes to your other theme, I would then be out in the community trying to find 20 placements, yeah. which <laughs> does not just triple my course load, but you know, exponentially yeah. gets bigger. Yeah. So we didn't do it in that context, but it would still be delightful because the, the mapping uh, course was about learning this campus mm -hmm. as a community, that uh, one that you're a citizen of, that you don't just uh, come to campus, take classes, and, and go away. Yeah. I mean, it's something we yeah. fight here yeah. on campus. Uh, students who just drive to campus, sit in a classroom, and, and go away, mm -hmm. and they don't really engage with us. So the class was to say there are more things going on here. There are stories here to be told, and you, this is your place. Yeah. And only if you know it do you want to become involved. But we wanted to actually take that idea to the whole Lethbridge community. Right. And so when we originally planned it, we had grand plans about how they would be you know, mapping not just the university, but also uh, yeah. uh, Lethbridge, uh, the city. And you know, we, a fair number of our students come from away mm -hmm. and actually don't know um, the, the city very well. And they can come and they can live in residence, have no car, 
and stay entirely on this side of town. So mm -hmm. in part it was cross the river and find out <laughs> about the rest, the rest of the world uh, uh, was uh, part of, of that um, interest. And I have to say this, uh, we've been talking about the you know, possibility of the, the project, in fact, to reinvigorate LibEd. I think it actually ties in nicely with President Mann's interest in community yes. service learning, yes. right? It's a nice yeah. way to see, see, yeah. see how those go together. I mean, it's easy for folks to think liberal education is like nerdy, pointy-headed, you know, ivory yeah. tower stuff. No, yeah. oh, it, it is what helps us be, as I suggest, good humans, mm -hmm. citizens mm -hmm. in our world in this well-rounded way. So that, yeah. I think that can be really a terrific way to bring those things together. Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in doing that, right? As you know, it's, it's, a t it's tough for lots of reasons. We have ethical considerations when we mm -hmm. send students into the um, community. There are risk management concerns when we send yeah. students into the community. All of those things we have to balance. But it's so rich, so rewarding. What I like about coming at it as a teaching and learning challenge mm -hmm. is that you're not then forcing the students to see the world that you, the way you see it That's or the way right. that you want them to see it. Because I sometimes hear people, you know, colleagues talking about wanting to try to use their classes to make their students more socially engaged or better citizens or whatever. I personally don't see it as my job to make them think anything. If they agree with me, well, that would be lovely. But if, mm -hmm. you know, of course, that, that's actually not what I see myself doing as a teacher. What I like about your approach is that you're creating opportunities for them to go out and explore the world, but connect with it in their own way, in ways that make sense for them in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And it's not about another stereotype of the universities that we're all you know, like lefties with these oh, lefty right, political right. views. Mm -hmm. And if you don't agree with us, you're not going to get a good grade. Mm -hmm. By creating these learning spaces for them, to connect with the world, to engage with political issues, broader social cultural issues, you know, whatever. But they still get to do it in their own way as a learning opportunity. Um, and it's not about you forcing a world view yeah. on them, yeah, um, yeah. which I find uh, I'm uncomfortable with that as some kind of pedagogical goal. So tell me a little bit more about your involvement with the LibEd program here. Well, I was first asked to teach a uh, segment in one of the liberal education classes. And I should stop and say that liberal education does not refer to a political party. Uh, so it's the, actually the University of Lethbridge was founded on this tradition. Uh, and it is about the idea of being a well-rounded person, that you uh, pay attention not only to the specialty that you major in, but that you're interested in the breadth of other approaches, and that those those things speak to one another, and that you're in, involved in your community. So we even talk about the four pillars of uh, liberal education. So Lib Ed, especially in the 1000 class, will take a topic. Um, and uh, I believe it's knowledge for the Lib Ed uh, 1000 still. And so they'll have someone who's a humanist speak, and someone who's a social scientist, and then someone who's a scientist. Mm -hmm. And the idea of that is that the same set of ideas are looked at from these very different perspectives, which I think is terrific. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've uh, taught in Lib Ed. Uh, and then I've been involved in designing a Lib Ed class, mm -hmm. which I'm very, very proud of. It's a little like the Praxis course, in the sense that this was to make uh, education be more than what just happens in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So this was a, a course I developed that was to help first year students mm -hmm. um, become not only uh, familiar with how universities work, but how this university works, and how this university is a community itself, mm -hmm. and also placed in the broader uh, Lethbridge uh, community. So it's called, uh, the, the first example of this was called mapping uh, commu self-community career and campus. And so what would happen is we would invite someone in, again, a, a historian. In fact, Sheila McManus <laughs> came and talked about her mm -hmm. research on mapping and, and uh, the uh, Canadian and American West. Um, and uh, scholars who were mathematicians, psychologists, fine arts professors, mm -hmm. all came to talk about the idea of mapping uh, from these various perspectives. And then students would do active learning style approaches to map this actual uh, campus. And so we sent them off to find where would you, if you had trouble with your computer, where would you go? And as teams, they would, they would figure this yeah. out. Uh, we asked them to try to understand some of the stories that are here on campus, and they went and collected uh, ghost stories on campus. Um, and all this went into a final mapping project where they, they each, in, in teams, so three teams when I taught this, 
produced a map of this campus that had all these layers of information. Mm -hmm. So liberal education is a little bit like the Praxis course in that it, it is about active learning, taking what you learn in the classroom and using it, because only then does it really become valuable to people once they need to use it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been wonderful. And then I'm involved in the, the, the project on liberal education on campus, which is to remind ourselves that this is one of our <laughs> founding traditions and how important it is in not only effective teaching, but effective research, mm -hmm. I believe. One of the things we have talked about in LibEd is uh, about producing new courses. Um, and so from a LibEd perspective, mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I would say in terms of teaching, what's wonderful about that is to bring different teaching uh, approaches yes. together in the same classroom, right? And, and it is a little tough. Students aren't really sure if they like this. We, we have colleagues who do the team teaching across the yeah. semester. Yeah. Students want to know who you are, what you do, and then become comfortable. Yeah. But the team teaching can sort of unseat that, which is not a bad thing in my yeah. view, not a bad yeah. thing. And what I like about that approach is I think too often lib ed can be associated with the humanities, yeah. right? Or like philosophy, English, mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. right? And it's, there's some notion that it somehow stops when we get to the natural sciences or, yeah. you know, our colleagues in health sciences or management, that somehow lib ed as a philosophy, as an approach, mm -hmm. has nothing to say to, yeah. you know, disciplines kind of on the outer edges mm -hmm. of a university. I think that's really unfortunate. I think you're exactly right. I mean, as we've been talking about this in uh, recent weeks, uh, the example of Ebola is the one that I think works really mm -hmm. well. To understand what's happened with Ebola, you must know the science of, of viruses and immunology yeah. and medicine, but you must also know the history of the people mm -hmm. and how, what are their medical practices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, must know the social science of what are their, what's their kinship system and how do they take care, care mm -hmm. of the ill and, the, and what do they do with their dead. Uh, health sciences, of course, is key yeah. in how do we manage yeah. uh, global health problems. And the management I just suggested is there as well. What do we talk about? What do we need to know about the management of aid, monetary, uh, mm -hmm. physical, all of those things. Mm -hmm. That's a great example of how a liberal education help someone know that this is not a simple problem. This is yeah. a complicated problem. Yeah. And the only when we really take seriously all those aspects do we really make some progress, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's another one of the things I appreciate the most about the Lib Air program, about the teaching center and the people that get brought together in it, is breaking down these disciplinary boundaries mm -hmm. that we have. I was so struck, I heard a presentation once on the history of UofL and the Lib Ed tradition. Mm -hmm. And when the university started, any 40 courses got you a degree. Yeah. And that's just radical by today's standards, because oh, we expect our students, 18 years old, right out of high school, to have a major, to already have the level of passion that we have about a thing. Mm -hmm. And then we ask them to just specialize around that. Mm -hmm. And I really am so proud that UofL has maintained, you know, the general lib ed requirements, mm -hmm. right? Like pushing our students to get some breadth, far more than I had right. as an undergrad. And I really admire that. You know, I mean, we may have slipped away from, we've had to as a modern university move a very far way away from any 40 courses get to a degree, yes. But there, if we can, there's something really uh, radical and transformative about that belief mm -hmm. in breadth and get outside whatever discipline you think you're going to specialize in and hear from instructors, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I find so attractive about the Lib Ed program. I agree with you. I mean, one of the things that, and you put your finger on it, university should also be about exploration. Yes. But yes. students and parents are concerned, well, will there be a job at the end? <laughs> and one of the things that we know is, yes, there will be. And in fact, if you're exposed to those multiple dimensions, you actually end up with the skills that that current uh, employers want. Um, there's a sort of a sense, I need to get into my major and see the job at the very end. But university is really about what it's everything you need to know mm -hmm. uh, that can lead you to a fulfilling career. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'm and a big believer. A flexible that. skill set is the single Absolutely. biggest advantage. More than little boxes of content under a tree, That's I right. think a flexible skill set is the best thing the modern university can offer to a student. Well, and in fact, this brings us back to group work. Because one of the things I didn't talk about, and I resented and resisted <laughs> group work as a <laughs> as an undergraduate too. And I will say to students, here is the job skill I know you must have. You will work in groups. Yes. You will work in some kind of a team, unless you're in a very specialized set of yes. uh, 
of uh, professions. You will have to get along with others. So in some ways, that's when you talk about the skills that lead to your yes. long-term uh, uh, future. The other thing I didn't say, and if you'll allow me just to come back to it, students want to feel that their individual work is recognized in group work, and that is mm -hmm. really the key. As mm -hmm. long as you let them know that, yes, if you're working harder than others, I will know and recognize that. Uh, that helps them to, uh, to, to fear the group work a little mm -hmm. bit uh, less. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to come back to an earlier point you'd made about respecting students mm -hmm. and connect this to a conversation we had just been having about <laughs> evaluations, the student oh, sure. evaluations. Sure, sure. And I think those of us who are really passionate about teaching, respecting our students as students, as adults, as learners, is, seems really central for a lot of us. Um, and then we come up against sometimes student evaluations that are not helpful, bordering on, you know, kind of vicious and mean sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we struggle a bit between how do we make, how do students feel heard, right? Your point, the point that you just made about they need to still feel heard even in a group. Mm -hmm. How do they feel heard when they want to give feedback about you and your teaching and your course? And that's entirely fair. Of course, mm -hmm. we need to hear back from them. But how do we balance that off against all of the other structural problems with, yeah. the, with student evaluations as they're currently carried out? What most students don't realize, and probably most people outside the university don't realize, is that most professors are sort of tortured by their evaluations. <laughs> yeah. They fear the evaluation, and they're tortured by the, the poor ones. Uh, and I think most young scholars don't realize that everyone gets poor evaluations. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets mm -hmm. the people who did not like everything from the cut of your jib yeah. when you walked into the room <laughs> to how you did something. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about this, but especially for us who were evaluated based on our, our, our teaching evaluations by, um, by the institution. Um, and so we worry about it, but what the students feel, and this is what you're alluding to, the students feel that their evaluations, that what they must write at the end of the semester, or they don't have to, but we encourage them to, mm -hmm. they feel that they go into some box and they're never heard. Mm -hmm. That I have said that your teaching was ineffective and I didn't like it and it was problematic in so many <laughs> different ways. Um, and that meant nothing, you're still teaching here next semester. I think there's... <laughs> I think there's sort of a whole How did I not get you fired I with my student evaluation? I was trying to get you fired and it didn't work. Um, and I do what I will tell students is, first of all, these things do have an effect, but you won't see them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the uh, teaching particularly is in the early career when we're trying to make sure that people get the support that they need, right, to help them become effective teachers. And that, that is going on. You may not see it. Mm -hmm. So you and I were talking about how uh, some of the sites that we know of, of like rateforyourprofessor.com, I think are a response to students to f that feel like those evaluations I, I filled out, they never turned into anything. And I want to know what other students say. Mm -hmm. And so these sites exist for students to go choose professors rather than I want to take ancient history. Well, take ancient history mm -hmm. then. Don't take it based on this person has a great uh, chili pepper rating, right? It's a poor way to choose uh, <laughs> your education, right? But I do think it's a response to students feeling like, I want to know uh, what other people have said about this class so mm -hmm. I can judge whether this is going to be good for me. And of course, this is the era of everybody doing a survey about every yeah. experience they've ever had. So yeah. they're very used to that, online surveys about yeah. everything. So I think you have to I guess I'm, this is a very long-winded answer to say, I think you have to take seriously what students want out of, uh, out of evaluations, mm -hmm. not just what the institution wants out of them. Mm -hmm. And that is an important thing that needs to be done here. So one of the things you can do as a, as a teacher is to give them more and different ways to evaluate you. And so this is something I do um, and something I encourage uh, young teachers to do, and that is midterm do a, uh, uh, an evaluation. This is not one that goes into your official file necessarily, but it gives you feedback about how well you're doing. And it lets students know that you care, mm -hmm. not at the end, mm -hmm. but in the middle mm -hmm. when you could actually change something. <laughs> you do something about it. <laughs> uh, what they, they think about it. And, and, and I'll give you an example from my own um, experience of something that was not going well, and this actually goes to your question about interdisciplinary teaching. I taught a women's studies class at Bryn Mawr. I was, it was me and a professor of uh, languages. I taught Italian. We didn't know each other very well. It was a course we both were teaching for the first time together. And boy, did the students not like us at all. <laughs> and so we would walk into the class, and it was a wall of ice. Right. And it was not going well. They weren't enjoying what we were telling them. And it just was, it was a miserable classroom situa situation. Pardon mm -hmm. me. And we've all encountered those. And so what we did is, 
uh, they all took a piece of paper and they each wrote down what I like best about this class, what I like least about this class, what I could do differently, and what the instructors could do differently. Mm. So that's a great evaluation for any time in the semester, by the way, because it makes them say, what, am I, what could I change here as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're not asking a lot of fussy specifics, but what's going well, what's not going well. But here's the thing I did that was really effective. I made them trade them and read them out loud. Hmm. And I'll, it was a small classroom, obviously. Uh, but I'll tell you, that was some hard stuff. So what you heard was people reading out loud their complaints about you in front of the rest of the students. Right? But it was magical. Right. Because first of all, they saw that we were willing to listen, as we did. And then they heard, this person said, I hate it when you do that thing. <laughs> and the other side of the room, I love it when you do that thing. And so they, they realized that we have competing demands, especially in an interdisciplinary classroom. Yeah. Yeah. And we're trying to meet your needs here, but we can't, in fact, please everyone, right? Um, and and the, uh, I tell this story to young um, teachers all the time. It entirely transformed that classroom, mm -hmm. right? So that's a good example of students feeling like their evaluation affected what happened um, and helped me improve my teaching dramatically, mm -hmm. all right? So you've talked about a couple of other strategies for letting students feel heard, like on that first day of mm -hmm. class, right? If they hear their own voice on the first day, you're going to hear from them over the rest of the term. So helping students feel heard, their feedback about your class, mm -hmm. um, there's other ways of doing it. How else can we put those evaluations to better use institutionally or mm -hmm. as part of someone's career? So part of it is helping students feel heard, yes. Part of it is how do we help perhaps our junior colleagues, our own selves when these things come in. How do we make better use of that feedback? I, I, I'll say, uh, we were talking about this earlier, that the current director of the teaching center, Dave Hinger, had, had made the point to me that teaching evaluations are not the goal. Uh, and we make a mistake. We think that mm -hmm. the evaluation is the goal. I have the evaluation now, uh, and I know I've done poorly, or I don't know <laughs> I've done well. Uh, they are a step towards what we hope is continued improvement in the teaching. Mm -hmm. So if we think about them that way, they start to function differently. Not, I'm terrified that this poor evaluation will end up in my, uh, my file and I'm being evaluated by my supervisors. But, oh, what I've done here is not effective. What do I need to do to address this? Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave has made the point, and I think this is very important, what you should be evaluated on is are the steps you've taken to correct it. Right. That's important. Yeah. yeah. Not that you struggled in the classroom, because we all do for various reasons, right? Is that you took it seriously, and then you took steps to, to, to make that better. Mm -hmm. And that's why the teaching center is so powerful, I think, is recognizing and let me say again, very as clearly as I can, I don't know anybody, anybody who cares about teaching or doesn't care about teaching, who's been recognized, who's not been recognized, who doesn't struggle at some point in the classroom. Yeah. We all do. It's not a cakewalk for anyone. <laughs> if you take it seriously, particularly, yeah. right? Yeah, if you don't care about it, then you, you must never be bothered by these things. That's right. Um, if you want to be a good teacher, at some point you're going to have some bad days. <laughs> That's right. And, but I'll, I'll say, I do think that some young teachers get shut down by teaching evaluations and then feel that I have no skills here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then, therefore, mm -hmm. this is not something that I can ever excel at, which is just not true at all. So the evaluations are your message. Now, yeah. what are you going to do about it? And the Teaching Center, of course, provides all kinds of resources for doing things about that. Mm -hmm. So that would be a much more effective way, in my mind, for the institution to deal with it. Let's see evidence of what you have done to improve your teaching. Yep. Right? And there are yeah. a million different things you can do there, from having a peer come in and evaluate you, that's mm -hmm. a very standard one, mm -hmm. um, to um, using the resources of the, of the teaching center, to workshopping it, which would be, you know, get a group of people together to talk about, I've, I'm struggling with this, how about you? And mm -hmm. you all work together, it's so many different things. Yeah. And those are wonderful moments when you talk to somebody who's teaching and they say, oh, I've tried this. <gasps> Yeah. That will help me tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it could encourage a more reflective teaching practice, too, because then you don't get stuck on that one horrible comment that's too that's right. that is playing around in, in your brain, mm -hmm. but the time you're writing up your annual 
your teaching evaluation, your, your, your PAR, you can take a moment to reflect on that a bit and kind of say, mm -hmm. you know, well, yeah, and I'm going to change this or I'm going to change that and be a bit transparent with it. That's right. Um, and I do think you, you know, this is, this is a comment as much for other uh, teachers as it is for um, other folks in the audience. We're looking for patterns, not the one-off cranky exactly. person. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I've yeah. written a one-off cranky moment because I just was having a day, right? <laughs> so people do that. And the other thing to remember about students is they feel powerless. Powerless mm -hmm. people take, uh, powerless people use anonymity to, to, mm -hmm. to try mm -hmm. to push back against what they think are mm -hmm. powerful people here, which is so striking because the professor thinks they're entirely powerless. Everybody feels powerless <laughs> in this relationship. <laughs> you know, it's ultimately it's a bit of a problem, yeah. right? right? Yeah. We yes. feel horribly powerless when you get that file, or it used to be like the actual paper printouts, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm, I don't I'm feeling know. stable enough to really open this today, you oh. know, and look and see. I had a professor who kept a particularly bitter and mean one in her drawer. And it, it shows you about the psyche of the professor. Yes. On a bad day, she would pull it out to remind herself of her failure. I oh. mean, why do that repeatedly? I, I, thought it, I found it very revealing about yeah. how professors really torture themselves about their yeah. reading. You know, and I do really think, you know, whether this makes it into the broadcast or not, and I'm trying to make sure it doesn't here, <laughs> are some people stop caring about their teaching because of this. Yeah. And because yeah. they give it too yeah. much weight. Yep. And they think, okay, I'm not good. Yeah. I can't improve yeah. this. There's nothing to be done here. Yeah. And that's the tricky balance, isn't it, between students needing to be heard, knowing that they had some impact at the same time as you as a scholar who's getting 40 or 50 or 180 of these comments back having to contextualize and balance them. That's right, that's yeah. right, I agree. So I don't mean to continue the, the theme of torture, but right. um, what have been your challenges as a teacher mm. this far, uh, thus far? Mm -hmm. um, what have been some things that you tried that went very badly? Mm -hmm. What do you think, what are you still working on? Or have you got your big award and you're just done now? Oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Guys all, in, yeah, I can just call it you're in perfect. now. Yeah, I can just call it in now. Yeah. Uh, what do I continue to work on? I, I always am struggling to get the right assessment tool for what I want them to learn. Yeah. Um, and you know, this is back to what we were talking about earlier. I want them to write research papers. This is a skill they must learn. But research papers, because they're so formulaic in a sense and stereotyped, they don't often challenge them to do what I care about, which is think like mm -hmm. an anthropologist for mm -hmm. a semester, right? So I'd, I'd like my assessments to show that thinking that I've been encouraging. So I'm always working for, towards that as one of the things that I, I care about. Uh, one of the struggles, and I will say that this is actually about the trajectory of teaching for a while, and you just start learning more and more about something. So I have a favorite <laughs> class. It's not a favorite, but it is one of my favorite classes, urban anthropology. I now know so much about it, it's hard for me not to tell them everything. Mm -hmm. and, that's actually not what they need or want or desire. Yeah. Uh, they need to know the fundamentals so they can start to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that my, one of my struggles now is to remember to, to know you can't tell them everything. You tell them the things they need to know for where they are. And again, it's remembering where they are, mm -hmm. not where I, I am in my own uh, thinking. So th those are a couple of things that I feel like I'm, I always struggle to try to get right. Um, I've had some uh, great failures. What, I'm trying to think of some really good ones for you. Uh, often it is about a failure to take control of the classroom. Mm. And I find that I, I do this even to this day. Um, uh, I'll give you one from my last semester, which I'm slightly embarrassed about. <laughs> so I had a student, actually a set of students who were on their laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were clearly not doing course-related materials. Right. But this was a 3,000 level class. Now these, so these are senior students, mm. right? Um, I think I'm a little embarrassed for them to behave so, that they behave so poorly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I should have called them out on it. I should have called them out, and I didn't. Um, and I wanna say here, I'll use this moment to say, we know now that if you are on your laptop, you're actually not going to be doing as well as the people who are not on their laptop. A laptop does not support you uh, knowing more, learning more. Mm -hmm. it, in fact, it may be an impediment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was just reading um, suggests that the people behind you are disturbed by your use mm -hmm. of the laptop too. And they may be there by yep. doing their best to uh, take notes, and, and which yeah. uh, people are saying is the most effective 
effective way to learn now, right? Mm -hmm. But they, they're distracted by what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And I know I was distracted. Um, and I let it go on too long. And I should have called them out. And, and he, this actually goes to something we've been talking about, Sheila. I do respect them as adults. It's hard to say something to someone you're seeing as an adult to call them out, embarrass them. If I t want to see them as high school students, yes, it's easy to say, you know, look, yep. Johnny, stop behaving badly. Yeah. But because I don't see them that way, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I have to tell you that. And, and if I do, you'll be angry. Other people will be glad that I've said it, but you'll be angry. And that's a good way to lose a student, by the way. If yeah. you embarrass them in class, let me stop and say, and one of the big things I've learned is teaching. If you embarrass students, you lose them. Yeah, for good. For good. Yeah. So then it's a real issue in your classroom how to stop a behavior and not embarrass them individually. So that went on too long in my classroom, but I'll give you a way I've dealt with something like that in the past, which is to make it a group project again. Mm -hmm. So how do folks feel about <laughs> technology in the classroom? And typically, they will say everything that needs to be said. Yes. The other students yeah. will say it for you. And, yeah. then, and then students are very compelled by their peers. If they hear, oh, I'm disturbing them, I don't care much about the person at the front of the room, the professor. But if my other, my yeah. colleagues around me are not liking this, then I won't do that yeah. thing. So. It's one of the little known, or perhaps very well known, I don't know, downsides of attempting a more critical and student-centered pedagogy. Mm -hmm. It's a good deal more work, mm -hmm. really. You know, I, the odd day, you know, I mean, I still, a couple of my lower level classes, I'll still lecture a lot. And the day that I'm just handing them that little wrapped box, mm -hmm. I don't really have to work about it because I'm in the authority position that they expect me to be in. But yet, once you change your view of them, mm -hmm. it becomes more difficult to then suddenly be the authoritarian person behind the podium, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, right? Or the... once you begin demanding more interactive and active learning on their part, you have to up your game, mm -hmm. you know, as well. What do you think are some other challenges of, you know, teaching, we make our own jobs harder as we yeah, raise our right. standards. The research shows the payoff will come in their learning, but mm -hmm. what are some other challenges of when you want to do better as a teacher, Mm -hmm. You've actually just made your job a little bit tougher. One of the things I would add to that is that being an engaged teacher who's caring about these things, you're more likely to find students in trouble. Yeah. And many of us yeah. don't want to know about yeah. students in trouble because that is more work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have to figure out how to get them in, in touch with the appropriate services and you know to give them the kind of support you need. And mm -hmm. some uh, instructors may choose not to do very much of that because it is more work. Um, and, and, I, and I think actually we're seeing more of those issues in our classrooms yes. than we used yeah. to. Um, so it actually comes back to something we were talking about earlier, which is you can't be driven by your content entirely. If yeah. you are entirely driven by your content, you will resent any loss of time. Mm -hmm. You will resent the work that's taken, that's necessary to, to build the foundational skills mm -hmm. and to deal with student issues. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I just know, and this is from being my age <laughs> and having done this a while, that it's more important and the content that is learned will be learned more effectively if you deal with these other issues. So um, I'm not sure I actually answered your question. I mean, I recognize it is a lot more work. And, and the, the big challenge is to take a breath, take it seriously yeah. and deal with it. And I've certainly been in the moment where I thought, no, I have to talk about this <laughs> last you know, concept, this last theory. If I don't get it covered, then. <laughs> but it's better. It's always better. I've always regretted making that choice. Yeah. Never regretted making the other choice, which is to slow down, to stop, to deal with it, yeah. right? But yeah. I, you know, you're in that moment, it's very hard to, to make yourself yeah. Recognize. I, yeah. I think that might be it, actually, Sheila. Recognize this is happening. OK, what's my choice? Run on down and keep lecturing mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. take a step out and say, OK, let's deal with this now because we need to deal with this. Yeah, it's that reflective pedagogy again, isn't it? Being aware of yourself in the classroom. It's yeah. another piece of critical thinking. Yeah, that's Critical true. thinking is being able to think about your thinking. Yeah, um, exactly. A more informed critical pedagogy is being able to think about your own pedagogy and realize mm -hmm. when it's going well, what do you need to get better? It would help contextualize those evaluations. Mm -hmm. It helps you respond hopefully better, more effectively to your students in class. That's right. Yeah. Well, and I'll actually use this to pick a fight with you and I'll ask you a question. So <laughs> I don't actually know it'll be a fight. <laughs> Um, so I think that one of the reasons that that happens is because we have, most of them ha have learned through lecture-based formats, right? Yeah. And so the lecture has a certain rhythm, a certain structure, and all of that. So, but now I know that I, I believe that you're sort of anti-lecture. See, I'm still pro-lecture. <laughs> 
So I think we, I, I, we should talk about that. And let me tell you why I'm pro-lecture. So I do I engage in group work and active learning, but mm -hmm. it's always balanced with lecture. Yeah. And, I, it, and I, this is, I should talk about this as a struggle nowadays. Uh, students come to me less able to deal with a lecture than mm -hmm. they used to be able mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a profound learning that goes on when you listen to me and then you say, all right, she said this and this. Mm -hmm. This is important, and I'm writing that down. And that, and I guess the neuroscientists are saying this is important. Heard, made a connection, yeah. wrote it. Yeah. And then when you yeah. go back and review it. And, there, and I see students, maybe you've seen it as well, we see students who do not take notes. Well, they don't know how uh, so often. And, yeah. you, and you look at them, you think, well, now, I know, and I'm telling you, we've talked about this in class, this will be on part of the assessment. Yeah. All right, this will be on the exam that you're taking. Why are you yeah. not noting this? Yeah. It's a good question if you think that yeah. they don't come, yeah. again, to a fundamental. I mean, I do this in intro class, I talk about approaches to note taking, mm -hmm. which is yeah. a good way. I slow yeah. it down and say, okay, here's a good way yeah. to do this if, yeah. you're, if you're unfamiliar. Yeah. Right? The no note taking thing doesn't bother me anymore because mm -hmm. I understand that that's my way of learning is I need to hear and write things down. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of realize that that's not for every student. And mm -hmm. some of them just want to listen. I had a student, a good student, but she sat and knitted through my lectures. Oh, wow. And at first it was kind of strange, but like that's, she needed to keep her hands busy doing something so that she could just listen. Maybe she so was knitting your ideas into the maybe, scarf. Maybe. I don't know what she was making. I should have gotten it by the end of the class or something. But I don't know if, knowledge. I, I wouldn't say I'm 100% anti-lecture. Mm -hmm. It's mostly, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years, but it is one way of teaching. It's not always the most effective or appropriate. Right. So it's, I've just thought a lot about um, uh, what percentage of the class of the course overall do I want to lecture in? Mm -hmm. What am I doing with those lectures? Kind of think hard about what I'm doing with those lectures. What purpose are they serving for me? Mm -hmm. And could they, could my students learn more effectively if I did something else? Right. So my first year classes are still probably 75 to 80 percent lecture and they're not going to drop too much below that. For me that's a 90 student class mm -hmm. and I've got a few thousand years of history to cover in 13 weeks. Right. You know, um, by the time you get to one of my third year classes, it's less than 50% because they're third years, because I want to make it more inquiry driven or readings driven, right. or, you know, something. Right. And then I don't lecture at all about the third year level. So, yeah. Yeah. yes, I have this anti lecture um, uh, reputation. Re reputation. It's just. Well, so that's you not know. actually very different than, than I don't the way it is. I, no, I don't think it right. is, no. Well, no. and you know, because we've had all these talks about classroom setup, and there is a sort yeah. of, but you need to make space for the lecture as well. Yeah. And an effective lecture yeah. still requires a certain kind of yeah. space that's conducive, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because as you know, if you, you can lecture and you watch the light go off, yeah. and that's exactly yeah. what you don't want to have yeah. happen. Right? For me, the joy of being a historian is that I'm telling a story. Yeah, so my lectures are, I am telling a story about an incident, a person, a period of time in the past. So um, I, I like to think that makes them more engaging. Who knows? Um, you know, but it, yeah. I've worked hard on making them very, very well organized. Um, but there's a narrative. I'm not just randomly jumping around to different facts and trying to connect it to an overall narrative. But yeah. You can still think about how to make your lectures better, can't you? you know? No, I mean, th I think that that's a very good point. And as you were talking, I thought, well, anthropology too, I tell stories, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. And I thought, well, so would that work for our, our colleagues in the sciences? Science is probably more challenging for we, them. But yeah. still, there's a narrative about why yeah. we should care yeah. that you know these chemicals behave in this way. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure that the yeah. narrative actually disappears, oh, right? Yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, I, and I'm thinking about this. I'm actually just thinking out loud, Sheila, because we have colleagues in the sciences who don't always feel that some of our techniques work for them. Yeah. And and I'm not. Maybe this is a way to even think about talking to them about it, right? That mm -hmm. you know what you're doing is a narrative arc. Even if you're just saying we start here in, in computer sure. science and we yeah. end here in computer yeah. science, that is a, that's yeah. a narrative, right? An experiment or problem solving has a that's beginning, right. a middle, and an end, and that's still a narrative arc. Oh, and plotted yeah. in a way. Yeah. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think it's good to keep in mind the disciplinary differences. I mean, as much as I like kind of collapsing them, and you like collapsing them. That's right. Um, there's no doubt that our colleagues in the natural sciences or health sciences have some very real content and structural limitations that I don't Absolutely. face, I don't think that I face in my discipline. The teaching center and my involvement with the teaching center, by the way, has been one of the most powerful ways I've learned that. Yeah, me too. Uh, you'll yeah. be sitting at the table and everybody, yeah. you think you're all on the same, uh, you know, everybody's on the same boat and talking about the same thing and then somebody will put their hands up, but, but <laughs> this does not work for yeah. me at all. Yeah. 
uh, or the I opposite experience. Mm -hmm. You think that they are fundamentally different yeah. from you <laughs> because they teach math yeah. or chemistry or right, right. nursing, and you suddenly realize that as teachers, you've got something in common. That's right. You know. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. No, yeah. And, and well, I mean, that's back to your question about interdisciplinarity. Uh, that's a really important thing. Helps me. Helps my brain, which yeah. always helps. You know. Yeah. In the classroom. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for your time today, Jan. I really appreciate you coming to talk to me today. Oh, you're more than welcome. I enjoyed doing it, Sheila. Thanks.